is investigative journalist and author Jason Herthler. I write regularly on Counterpunch and Dissonant Voice and the Greenville Post and a variety of other uh, progressive left uh, sites. And I'm occasionally on uh, RT and, and uh, Press TV and, and those channels that are outside of the mainstream. So I wanted to just uh, suggest make a few points about what I think the kind of world that we live in in the states as I've experienced it and I think others have experienced it. Um, first I, I wanted to point out that I think as I think Noam Chomsky calls it we live inside this doctrinal system um, and this system is established by uh, I think what they call the Overton window which defines the spectrum of acceptable debate in any society uh, and what defines what acceptable opinion is in any society um, and I think in our in our society our corporatocracy our oligarchy I think what we have is uh, a spectrum of debate that allows us to talk in the mainstream media about anything that supports the corporate oligarchy um, that owns and runs uh, the state. And that, to me, the corporate oligarchy includes the Wall Street banks, the defense industry, the energy industry, and that includes not just the oil and gas companies, but companies like Monsanto and Bear Crop Science, who I used to do some work for before I realized what was going on. Um, and then also the Pentagon and the intelligence ag agencies in the state and uh, the mainstream media, which I think is part of that, but they kind of act as a front organization for uh, the criminal oligarchy. So I think that the oligarchy, anything that supports what the oligarchy uh, wants is acceptable opinion within the spectrum of debate. The oligarchy that profits off of war and the expansion of the neoliberal world order. Um, if you think about how these uh, how the, uh, the oligarchy profits off of war. Well, the defense industry profits by selling the guns um, that take down uh, a regime uh, or a regime or a government uh, wherever uh, they want, whether it's Iraq or Syria or Libya. But they also sell guns into the new uh, regime that's propped up, if one is propped up. You know, in Libya, we, they still have a propped up haven't stood up a government uh, in any real sense. Um, but then the banks profit by uh, funding through loans uh, and kind of enslaving these emerging economies that we uh, attack and overthrow, enslaving them with debt, and they make endless uh, compound interest off the loans that they get. We see that happening in Greece. Um, the defense industry, the energy industry comes in, obviously. We've shown all the big oil companies and gas companies establish themselves in Iraq now and they'd like to do the same thing in Syria um, and then the other group is the media and the intel agencies in the Pentagon they come in and they establish well they set up a uh, generally puppet regimes that they can run in those countries so all of these uh, elements of the oligarchy are profiting off of war and the way they are able to promote their agenda is by creating a doctrinal system that promotes a particular narrative to all of us. Because if all of us knew the real story, we probably would not permit it to happen. We don't want our governments going around and savaging and bombing the hell out of brown men, women, and children in countries all across the Middle East, which is what we've been doing this entire century. So they have to create a propaganda narrative that tricks us and fools us and tells us something different that's more believable, that's more acceptable. Um, so the first thing is, the first idea is that we're living in this doctrinal system and what's acceptable is what supports and furthers the agenda of the corporate oligarchy. So within that system to establish that doctrinal control a propaganda narrative needs to be created. And the 
the propaganda narrative and the limits of debate, I think, are established by what I would call a false historical narrative. And the evolutionary biologist Robert Trivers wrote a book called The Folly of Fools, and I would encourage you to take a look at it, where he, uh, he, was, the, he was the evolutionary biologist that kind of discovered the evolutionary foundation of self-deception. And he says that whole societies, he argues uh, very powerfully that whole societies are uh, susceptible to falling, uh, to self-deceiving themselves and falling under the influence of a false historical narrative. And he uses the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as uh, a model by which to explore that. So I think in America we have a false historical narrative and the oligarchy needs to create that to win our support for its imperial wars. What was his name again, please? Robert Trivers. Thank you. And what is it? Folly of Fools. Val? What was it, Val? Hmm? Oh, thank you. Yeah, Robert Trivers. And it's, it's the false historical narrative, which is the, the construct that he produced that I think that we are uh, invested in. I think that's what the oligarchy has created. And what is the false historical narrative? It's largely a narrative, a storyline that inverts reality. So um, the other night I saw 1984, the play, right, where Orwell said, uh, war is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. You see the inversion. You're taking war and telling people it's its exact opposite. Freedom is its exact opposite. And even uh, Sigmund Freud, I believe, argued at one point that if you really want to understand what a society's values are, simply invert the moral maxims of that society. So if the commandment says, do not commit adultery, it's because we all want to commit adultery. And I think that formula, it's very similar to Orwell's formula, and I think that's a defining characteristic of a false historical narrative. We invert the reality, the facts on the ground. And I think that's what we're seeing in Syria and what we saw in Iraq. So if, if and, and with this Russiagate narrative, where if the mainstream media is telling you that Russia is a hostile, hungry, imperial power <laughs> looking to take over Eastern Europe and then move into Europe and enslave the Europeans to its energy pipelines. And think about that, flip it, and, and America on the other side is always the judicious, <laughs> noble power that wants to stay out of it but is forced by these children to come in in a paternalistic fashion and intervene for humanitarian or other reasons and separate the kids on the playground. And if you think use that formula of the false historical narrative and invert that, what you get is the United States is the imperial power looking to push NATO right up to the doorstep of uh, Russia, going back on its promises that it made to Gorbachev after the uh, collapse of the uh, Berlin Wall. And you find that Russia only has, I think, maybe 10 bases outside of its borders. One. One? Is it one? In Syria. In Syria? Out of the old USSR. Yeah, okay. And then we have, I've read, between 600 and 800 bases all around the world. So who's the imperial power here? Um, so that's what I think happens in the establishing of the propaganda narrative. And I think there are three quick points I want to make about what the storytelling elements of that narrative are. The first is find an enemy and demonize that en enemy. And we see that with Assad. We saw it with Gaddafi, um, where they were actually, the mainstream media was telling us stories that Gaddafi was giving Viagra to his troops and telling him to go out and rape people in the countryside. Insane fictions that we believe and we bought. And to allow Hillary Clinton and uh, Samantha Power to convince Barack Obama, and Obama got behind it, and they went in and, and through NATO, they backed terrorists, and they basically served as a terrorist air force to get rid of Gaddafi, who had created, for whatever his flaws, he had created the most progressive um, state in North Africa that functioned as the security anchor against terrorism in North Africa. 
And you know, what about we always hear, let's we have to save the uh, Affordable Care Act. We have to save the 12 million people on Medicare that were Obama put on Medicare. Yeah, great, fine. But what about the 18 million Syrians who lost their free health care? What about the 6 million Libyans who lost their free health care and education? Mm. We don't talk about them. And I think that's one of the disconnects that the propaganda narrative creates in us. We domestically can kind of see what's happening, but when it's something abroad, when we're not on the ground experiencing it personally, it's, we're much more susceptible to a doctrinal narrative that inverts reality. So I think you demonize, you find an enemy and demonize them, and then you romanticize yourself. You turn, you talk about American exceptionalism <coughs> and manifest destiny and the, and the Monroe Doctrine and all of the, the storylines that have turned America in our minds into this mythical shining city on a hill that <coughs> defends the interests of the voiceless around the world and that promotes free market democracy wherever we can. Um, and if we didn't, if we weren't leading the world, there would be a void and it would be filled by the ogreish Russians and the other dictators from um, around, the, around the planet. And the third piece is to, you demonize the enemy, you romanticize your side, and then you eulogize the victims. So we've got this character, uh, the, the Syrian rebels, thousands, tens of thousands of whom were imported from Western China and Iraq and Turkey and Afghanistan and trained and armed and funded and injected like an infection into Syria to attack this Assad regime. And we are told that these people are freedom fighters trying to throw off the shackles um, of this horrible tyrant, uh, evil optometrist, I call him, uh, Bashar al-Assad. Not to say that Bashar wasn't part of our rendition program, because he was. And I think that we sent people over into Syria and tortured the hell out of them. Assad was part of that. He's not, he's not perfect. But when I, when I write about this, I don't focus on, on him so much. I focus on my country and what my country is doing and what we can do to stop our own country from committing crimes, wars of aggression, basically, abroad. And the third piece that I wanted to mention, first you have the doctrinal system that we're all ensnared in. Within that, there's a propaganda narrative that inverts reality that we buy into, and when it's about foreign policy, it's much easier to buy into it because we're not in Syria, we're not in Iraq, we're not in Libya, we only get these secondhand reports, so it's incredibly important when you're reading about foreign policy to look for outside sources, outside the mainstream. And that mainstream, of course, is all of the, all of the groups that um, Dr. Miller mentioned, uh, MSNBC, CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, you know, Fox, the ones on the right. Um, corporate, not mainstream. The corporate. They're the, not mainstream, corporate. Well, okay, that's, that's an interesting distinction explore that. Um, the third piece, you've got a doctrinal system within it, you've got a propaganda narrative, and then you need a communication strategy to get that word out. Well, there are two things I think are important here. One is credibility, and the second is visibility. And by credibility, I mean you need to use authoritative sources to tell your story. That's, that's the most important thing in getting people to believe. All the news that's fit, fit to print since, I don't know, 1852 or whatever it was, right? For most of us, that's an authoritative source. And, and you know, when we read a, a, a movie review or a theater review, it's well-written, it's cult, it's uh, erudite, it's educated. And so when we read the political articles, we don't even think that maybe now we're shifting into an area where we're being fed propaganda. And I think authoritative, finding the authoritative sources is very important. Who's telling your story is critical. Um, and secondly, with that is uh, the use of influencers, the use of uh, cultural figures who can come in and support your narrative, uh, the Hollywood community or whoever it is that can come in and back that narrative. And um, then you also want to create, for credibility, the appearance of uh, consensus. 
right? So the appearance of consensus is uh, tied to the idea of visibility. Consensus is established, the appearance of consensus is established by channel flooding, by flooding all of the media outlets possible with your story. It's not enough just to have it on the New York Times front page on the website. You need it in the print edition as well. You need it on Twitter. I think the New York Times has something like 16 or 17 different uh, Twitter accounts mm -hmm. and uh, Facebook accounts for all of their different subcategories and they get the message out on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube especially and now you see YouTube defunding alternative voices that talk about uh, you know precious issues like ISIS. Well they're going to get defunded and the advertisers don't want to appear on their platform. So they take and then you've got you've got other categories too. You've got broadcast, you've got radio, you've got email, you've got a variety of other uh, channels. The proliferation of digital channels is immense, and that's channel by flooding those channels with your propaganda narrative, always being consistent and staying on message. That's how you create the appearance of consensus. Mm -hmm. So there may be an appearance of consensus if you read uh, the Washington Post. I remember before the uh, war in Iraq, the Washington Post editorial board got together and said, uh, created an article and said, the article was titled, uh, Irrefutable. <laughs> and the opening line was something like, it's hard to imagine how anyone mm -hmm. could not believe that Saddam Hussein is harboring weapons of mass destruction. So you read that and you think, well, this is a reputable magazine, reputable source. And you read that, you think, well, there's clearly a consensus about this. So you, it's coming from a reputable source. There's consensus. So at that point, and it's everywhere, and you're here, you're getting hit with this same story and claim from all the media sources that you consume. So at that point, the peer pressure kicks in. Hmm. And you think, well, do I have enough information to defy this narrative? Do you even, are you even questioning at that point? And so what you do at that point, I think, is begin to internalize the narrative of power and the storylines of empire. And that's when, that's when we lose. And that's the war um, the professor was talking about, uh, the propaganda campaign to get us into World War I. The Creel Commission um, was a, the leading uh, executor of that um, campaign. And if you look at Robert or George Creel, George Creel's book, How We Advertised America, one of the first things he talks about is the war before the war, mm -hmm. winning the media war. Mm -hmm. And I think what I, I've just tried to describe to you are, are uh, a few different ways in which uh, the mainstream, the corporate media tries to win that war. So thanks very much.